We're going to start out today in John 18.10 through 19.16a, which I've introduced before. We're going to get into it a little bit, and we're going to save some for other videos. But what you see on screen right now is that I've collapsed several of the lines. It's very tall. Lots going on here. The majority of the text is in this other section at the bottom. What's written in 18, 10 through 21 is repeated in 18, 22 through 19, 16a in reverse order. You can tell by this bar that I clicked on that this is the part that's repeated down below. And by reverse order, it indicates to us that it's a chiasm. The structure is an eight plus eight chiasm that spans across two chapters in its broad reach. Starts in 1810. Here's where 19 begins, right in the middle of the section. It goes down to 16 line A. And how do we know? Well, I've analyzed the context. I've analyzed what comes before and after. And this is definitely a single unit. And how do we know? Well, the details reveal it. We're going to get into some of those. It is curious how part of the action of the scene of the arrest is separate from that and joined rather with the scene of issue as trial and abuse. This matter of crossing over structurally connects the two scenarios together. And that's a very curious thing. Naturally, we wouldn't think to break it during the scene of the arrest and connect the scene of the arrest with this other part down here that includes the trial and ends in Yeshua being condemned to death. But the Lord has his purposes in doing these kinds of things. So we discover what they are when we look at the details. And there's a lot to look at in this section. And, you know, it, <clears throat> it, it really bears mentioning that this is some of the most extreme material in the narrative of the Bible because of the subject matter dealing with the Lord's trial, his suffering, and the crucifixion. And then uh, in the latter sections, his uh, burial. So it's very difficult and very emotional. So when you come to these things and you look at it, it it's hard to just kind of be detached emotionally. You have to engage with it and discover what it is that's really on the Lord's heart and mind. What kind of things is he conveying to us here? And of course, we're looking at it now because it has to do with the manifestation of love. And it is uh, really the test, the final test of love, if you're willing to die for your friends. And that's what we're seeing here. So it's really the pinnacle of the relationship where the Lord did what he was asked to do. He had an option, he had choices, but he chose to die for his friends. And not so we don't have to, but to show us the way, because this is the road to glory. So what we want to give our attention to here is this eight by eight structure. And so when you consider how this first part matches up to the last part, you'll see that it uh, manifests in certain ways. I'm going to go ahead and follow through on this note. The bar spanning 18, 10, and 11 is this one in the second column. So now this is where we see it match up with the top to the bottom. This part of the scene of the arrest is separated from the rest of that account. This joins the scene of the arrest to the account of the trial, abuse, and the Lord's being condemned to die. Most particularly, the narrative about Peter's use of the sword links to 18.29 through 19.16a, the A and A prime of the chiasm. And by that I mean that this would be an A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, H prime, and then down to A prime. And this A prime 
down here in 29, 1829 to 1916a. This is the largest component of this set that's dominated by the trial. If we grasp something of the profound nature of the cup the Father gave Jesus to drink, we gain some insight. We see in this pair of bookending components how the King of the Jews has a superior authority and a kingdom that is heavenly. Our vision is elevated to see beyond the merely temporal realm that the conflict will be settled in the heavenly realm where the eternal perspective is manifest. The cup that was the subject of Jesus' prayer in the garden, which we learn about in other gospel accounts, was not to be removed, but rather fully drunk according to the Father's will. Peter's bold action was the full extent of resistance offered. And a point is made about the church militant and the carnal nature that is focused on the temporal realm of the flesh. As I scroll this down, you see this green in the midst of the blue. And I've highlighted this differently to call attention to this correspondence. I'm going to read 18, 10, and 11. This is the part of the scene of the, the arrest where action, extreme action is taken by Peter. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And how is that a match to what's going on at the trial? Well, reference is made to it here in verse 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. And you might say, ah, but Peter was fighting so that he wouldn't be delivered over to the Jews. Well, he, he took one action that was necessary. And of course, Jesus told him to put his sword into its sheath. And he also healed Malchus's ear, as we know from another account. It's not written here. But here we see the correspondence between the A and the A prime. So there's a link. And while it's only just a small fraction of this larger text that's down here, it's significant and notable. And because 18, 10, and 11 is clipped from the rest of the scene of the arrest, we have to see its inclusion here in this particular structure as very central to what's going on here. And if you've read and, and reread and you really understand what's going on in this, uh, this unit of text that spans the presentation, you have to understand that this is really about the kingdom and how not to war and how to war. We're not here as agents in the carnal realm. We're not here joining militias, taking physical action, laying up um, armaments and provisions for the flesh. Surviving, we're not survivalists. We're not preppers. We're not any of that. What we are is expendable, frankly. How about, how about Jesus? He was delivered over to the Jews to death. He was expendable because the Lord had a better plan in mind. Because the kingdom that's of note here is not temporal, not in the physical realm. It's beyond that. It doesn't mean it, it doesn't exist. It certainly does exist. It's just in a higher realm. And it spans all the ages. Aaron? And to that point, I just want to mention a couple of things that the Lord brought to mind there. We've talked about uh, a lot. You know, there is a fate worse than death, and you can live too long. So certain things to keep in mind in, in that context. Absolutely. So I'm going to read, continue reading in the third paragraph of this comment window. The context makes it pretty obvious that the names are relevant. Malchus 
In Hebrew, his name is derived from Malek, meaning king. The companion text highlights Jesus of Nazareth as the king of the Jews. The name Simon, right? Right up here, Simon Peter. The name Simon means hearing. And we see him severing the right ear from the head of the high priest servant. I perceive that a statement is made about the hearing ear and also about the status of Jesus, the real Malchus, Malek, and King during the trial and while suffering abuse. There's more here to learn that I continue to seek after. There's a lot that I don't understand. Next in sequence, the bar spanning 1829 through 1916a. So we're going to drop down to this one here. But before I open that up, I'm going to close this window and walk through this little structure here. So by the way these bars appear in the third column, we can see that the first part is repeated in the second, because these are the companions. How so? In the same order. So what we have on this next level, the fourth column, is a parallelism. And the A elements are highlighted here, and the B elements are highlighted here. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. So Peter draws the sword from his sheath, and then he's told to put it back. Pretty obvious matchup. And down here, we have a curiosity. And struck the high priest servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? There's an interesting connection. Are they paired? Well, they absolutely are because we've analyzed the structure and we know that they're paired. So there is some profound insight concealed and revealed in this pairing. And to really understand the cup that the Father's given him to drink, you have to see the connection here between the real high priest, who is the king, and the relationship of the, the hearing ear. And the, the cup that the Father has given him to drink, of course, we understand that he's drinking it. He's choosing to drink that right now. And it's of his own volition, a free will choice. And so, um, there's, there's a lot more there than I uh, understand at the present. I've had glimpses of it in the past, and I understand that in this next season, when, when we're in Yeshua's own shoes and uh, going through our own um, season, as I've called it, our final exam, Gethsemane, and then, then more insight will be given and more provision will be given us like it was given to Yeshua. So in this section, I've broken it out into four lines, and the first two are repeated in the second two. How so? It's another parallelism. And struck and cut off his right ear. That's pretty obvious. The high priest's servant, the servant's name was Malchus. Again, pretty obvious. And the reason why isn't just to give it a lyrical quality as we read it. The reason why is because there is profound insight that's bundled up in these things. Some of it, it seems obvious, some of it not. This pairing here, not so obvious, very profound. Now in this next section here, I'm going to click on this commentary window. And at this point in time, I'm not going to go through all the detail of how things line up down here get to a certain point, then we're going to move on and save the rest for another video. So this span represents the largest unit of the presentation's 8 plus 8 chiasm. It's the A prime of this lengthy structure. The subject matter represents some of the most significant activity of the age. 
In the narrative of 8, 10, 10, and 11, the A component, we find the scene of the Lord's arrest concluding with some high drama. This text, A prime, is curiously paired with that, featuring the trials and abuse the Lord suffered that concluded with his being condemned to death. I believe that this is really primarily relating to the drinking of the cup. And it's not just for Jesus, it's for those of us who will walk in his shoes. And I mentioned time and again that this is preparation for us. So if you haven't yet come to terms with that, I invite you to do so. It's very sobering. And uh, when I mention about the trial in Gethsemane, we've got uh, three studies on the Mount of Olives and what happened in Gethsemane. And if you're not familiar with those, I invite you to um, explore those and kind of make it your own. So what's written in 1829 through 198 is repeated in 198 through 16 in the same order as a four plus four parallelism. And I'm describing the, stru the structure of this long section here. And I'll explore that further at another time. Now in, in this other matchup, I'm just going to collapse that one and expand this one. When we read in verse 14 that it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people, we can see in this concern for expediency a perception of the need for a sacrifice. Passover is referenced in this text companion, verse 28, right here. And the mention of a legal requirement that is associated with the feast reminds us of how the willing sacrifice meets every truly legal requirement. And I point you to Hebrews chapter 9. And I've got two other verses referenced here. From John 1, 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is a reference to the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. And in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. So there's a lot of scripture that's being fulfilled, a lot of scripture that's actually being fulfilled in this section in John 18 and 19. And in these matchups, it's, it's really very interesting. Um, I don't have a lot of commentary on them, but I'm going to take a moment and explore these. So verses 12 and 13 are repeated in 14 through 16. How so? Here we have a chiasm. In these inner parts, here we're talking about Caiaphas. For he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. That's pretty obvious. What's expanded upon is this outer section. And 12 and 13a reads, So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas. And so here we have more leading. And we have another disciple who is leading. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest, yep, there's redundancy, right? Went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. 
And we see here that 15 is repeated in 16. How so? It's another chiasm. And I mentioned the redundancy, and, and this is really pretty obvious in this middle section. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, so the other disciple who was known to the high priest. And that is a kind of a low-hanging fruit situation that sets us up. And, and so we know that these sections correspond. In the first to the last, Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. So the intersection here is even more obvious. He entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside at the door. Contrast. So the reason for these is organizational, positional, and we see a lot of that in, in, the, in the constructions in this chapter. So these are the kind of things that we're led to track. And again, sometimes there's not really anything very profound that appears on the surface, but a lot of it is the low-hanging fruit that helps us to really lock in to those things that are the more profound. And in corresponding to this section, we have verse 28, where again, there's a leading. And the dynamic down here is very interesting. 28 A and B is repeated in C and D. How so? It's a parallelism. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's quarters. They themselves did not enter the governor's quarters. It was early morning so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. And here we have the timing. And I'm, I talked about the structural things that are kind of a theme that uh, wind through this. And the timing is also winding through this, and the timing is very special, as you may know. And this kind of sets us up for the next section, because here we see the timing isolated. It was early morning, so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. And that was important to them, and the religious Jews needed to be able to eat the Passover. This is something that uh, is very ironic because who's really the Passover lamb here and what are they doing? Well, they're preparing for that sacrifice. And there is a fulfillment of the Passover, not the final complete fulfilling of the Passover, but this was a significant fulfillment. And so these people are all kind of carrying out their roles, doing what they need to do. And so we see the, the change of position here with regard to the trial and the, the governor's corridors here, which um, some are going freely and some are not really going to go willingly and freely at all. And in the companion section up here, this is, kind of dynamic that we see here. Peter couldn't go in, but it's arranged by the other servant, so Peter could go in. So the themes here are, are pretty obvious. And because of the timing issue that's brought up, again, we're really set up for this next set. So I'm gonna collapse those and this one should be familiar. As I introduced this in a previous video, together with its structural companion, 1825b to 27, in the lighter blue, this text is of particular interest. Peter's series of denials fulfills what Jesus had prophesied to him earlier that day. John 13, 38, 
Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. Peter must have denied Jesus before morning came. During the rooster crowing watch, which would have been roughly 12 hours later. Now I mentioned that we were set up with timing as we're working our way in to the chiasm. So in that second section in, in the B prime element, we were seeing the isolation of the early morning in the reference to Passover. And now here, there's definitely a timing involved because of the fulfillment of John 13, 38. As you should know, John 13, 38 is the basis for the keystone pattern. If you're not familiar with it, I've got a link right here. The account of that prophecy's fulfillment in John 18 is therefore of special interest. What does it mean that this prophecy about the count of Shemitah was given and fulfilled on the 13th day of the first month? It must mean something, especially when the collection of related items is considered. For example, it was on an anniversary of that day that I received the revelation about the keystone pattern in 2008. In 2015, seven years later, it was again on the 13th day of the first month that Aaron and I received a notable sign indicating to us that the model was masked. With reference to the model of the chronology of the end, in the application of the keystone pattern. Not long after that came the revelation that time was going to be reset into the past. As we take all this into account, together with the esoteric meaning of Judas's betrayal, it seems to be indicating when time will be reset and what will be happening then. A final observation, it seems a rather conspicuous omission of anything in this narrative like with the result that Jesus's words were fulfilled with reference to John 13, 38. And given how many other times we find that in the context, that is a rather conspicuous omission. I'm gonna just show you what the structure is here. As I hover over the first line, we see that there is no completion in this first section alone. This is just simply one, two, three, but the completion is down here in this second section. Now you could say, if you ignore this part up here, that this kind of stands alone, 25 B, C, and D is repeated in 26 and 27 A. They said to him, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? Did I not see you in the garden with him? Here's the accusation. He denied it and said, I am not. Peter denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. So it's complete. There's a structural symmetry down below. Up here, there is no structural symmetry. It's just the, the initial presentation, which is notable. And it gives emphasis, it draws our attention to it. Why is it not repeated up here? And I believe there are several things you could take away from that. And it's telling us basically to be attentive to the numbering. This is a time thing, right? It was prophesied that Peter would deny him three times before the rooster crowed. And the rooster crowing watch is the last watch. In Roman times, there were four watches of the night. The rooster crowing watch was the last watch before the sun would rise. And so the timing is part of the setup for what's being fulfilled right here. And both the prophecy was given and fulfilled on the 13th day of the first month. And we find in number, there are three lines introduced here, one, two, three. And then they're completed down here with a repetition, a second repetition here, and a third and final repetition here. 
And there's, with regard to the count of Shemitah from the sign of 1991, as I know a lot of you are very familiar with, this is significant because it doesn't say there will be four. Some would think, well, in this four Shemitah, here we are now from the fall of 2019 going on another seven years. Do we need a time reset? Well, we absolutely do. At no point is it declared here that you'll deny me four times. And there's nothing like that. And we've covered a lot of keystone patterns, a lot of time reset scriptures. And we understand the pattern. The model was masked. But it's being unmasked. I believe it has been unmasked. We'll know to what degree soon, but the 13th day of the first month is obviously very significant. And what's happening in the context here is that Yeshua is having uh, an, an entry into his greatest trial here. And it was denied for Peter to go with him at the time. There was a conversation that they had about that. And Peter said, well, you'll deny me three times. And it's not yet your time, Peter. And it was not yet time for his disciples, and it won't be time yet until it's time. Peter's time came when he would give his life, when he was crucified upside down, as history reports. And it will be time for those whom Peter was a prophecy of, the church, in particular the bride, when their time will come. And that's what's being projected here through time to us now. This is not about Peter then. It's not historical. We're looking at the prophetic view. And the time will come when Peter will be allowed to follow in the Lord's footsteps. So we're going to leave off with this study of John 18.10 through 19.16 for now. When we pick it up, we're going to resume working our way through. Thanks for watching. God bless you. Bye-bye.